How many people? I, I'm not sure. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Welcome. If you are so inclined, please um, use the chat to tell us where you're tuning in from. I'm in Seattle. Greg's on Bainbridge Island. Susan's in France. Tacoma, Bainbridge Island. Welcome. Seattle, welcome. Portland, hello. Finney Ridge, St. Paul, welcome. Boston, hi. And Anchorage. Hello, hello. Maui, oh, wouldn't we all like to be there right now? <laughs> Mount Lake Terrace, hello, welcome. All right, I'm gonna give it just a few more seconds and then we will get started. Sammamish, hello, Sarah. All right. All right, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Laura Hamilton. I have a cookbook shop in Seattle, Washington called Book Larder. And in typical times, we do lots of author talks and cooking classes in the shop. And so for the past year or so, we have taken those online. And the wonderful part of that is that, um, as you can see in the chat, people from all over the country and all over the world can join us for these conversations. And we can also have discussions with authors like today's guest, Susan Loomis, who is all the way in France, joining us um, from the other side of the world. So we'll look for those uh, silver linings where we see them and, and make the most of, of uh, the situation today. Um, Susan's book is called Plot Du Jour, and it's available from booklarder.com. I will put a little uh, link in the chat so that um, if you are inclined to do so, you can order directly from there and support this talk in our independent bookstore. She's going to be in conversation with Seattle writer and chef Greg Atkinson. Um, they are going to talk, um, you know, they're old friends, so they'll have a lovely chat and you will also have the chance to ask questions. If you could just use the Q&A button for those questions, we'll leave some time at the end and um, I'll jump in and field as many of those as we can get to. Um, but now I'm gonna turn things over to Susan and Greg. Hello, Susan. I, oh, I've got you muted, excuse me. I, I... Yeah, that's typical. I don't really have anything to say, Greg. So I just <laughs> muted myself. Great to that's see you. That's why you write all these books. <laughs> it's great to see you. So you're looking very well, and I am so very excited about the book. It's it's just gorgeous. It's uh, it's not only like visually cool. I, I I love books anyway. Like I I have a you know thing about them, and this one it just seems well made. It's uh, it's beautiful. It's well laid out, and reading through it, I felt like I got to spend an afternoon with you in the kitchen. You know all the little stories the. The bits of history, it's so much like hanging out with you and having a conversation. I, I really like the book, Susan. It's gorgeous. Thank you, Greg. Thank you. That means a lot to me because, you know, when I write a book, I put all these things in it. And you, ne you really don't often know if people are appreciating the little tidbits and side stories and things like that. It's almost like an armchair vacation. <laughs> oh, well, especially now. <laughs> right. Well, it's something we all need, I think. So I wondered uh, how how long have you been working on this? I, I it seems like it it sort of popped up for me uh, because we've been a little bit out of touch, and suddenly here was this gorgeous book, and I thought, God, how long has she been working on this? And how much fun did she have researching it? You must well, have had a blast. Oh, I had a blast, and you know, in a way, it's it's a culmination of a lot of different projects I've worked on because the plat du jour, which means dish of the day is sort of the reincarnation of farm food. You know, it's the farm meal that the farm wife made, depending what she had in the garden or in the farmyard. And I say, I refer to farm wife and she, because I must, because it's women who cook at home in France on the farm, still to this day. Men Naturally, are in- the <laughs> As the French would say, naturellement. The uh, naturellement. culture are very deeply 
ingrained there. Deeply, you know, and so I, you know, as you know, I love farms. I hang out with farmers. I, you know, I fish. What your first couple of books, farmhouse cookbooks? Kinda, yeah. Like my the, I did three. I did one in France, one in the U.S., and one in Italy. They were lovely. So I love what comes from the farm, and the plat du jour is in in the plat du jour. That title is a restaurant title. You know, it's part of the formule, it's the main dish, you get a first course, maybe you get a dessert, but it's the chef going to the market and saying, what's, what's local, what's seasonal, what's abundant, what's cheap? And then taking whatever that is home and making a gorgeous meal with it. Well, as you know, the price doesn't always, uh, isn't always a clear indication of the quality of a thing. The True. simplest foods can be, immensely valuable in their own right just because well, of their flavor and color you know and that's one thing about the about simple hearty food like this i mean there are some elegant dishes in here but like the one that you're doing with the monkfish and the white beans you know that's an elegant dish but that's a play that was from a chef in my neighborhood and we were talking and he said you know i was going to do lamb with white beans and that's very that's traditional so and he said wait a minute what's stopping me from using monkfish instead of lamb? Right. So it's a modern, very contemporary dish, but it's a play on something as old as time. And the idea of a fish with a legume, like yeah. the classic salmon and lentil, it, it just feels correct, you know, that dish. Yeah. Like I saw it and I thought, oh, I like that. I would order that. <laughs> you know, and I felt the same way. And you make it, it's kind of monochromatic in the most gorgeous way. Mm -hmm. You know, these beautiful white fish, these beautiful whitish kind of ivory beans. I love the dish. I'm so glad. Um, I'm, I'm glad. To, um, and I have to confess, there are some challenges with it, you know, uh, and it's, it's part of what happens when you're translating from book to table. You know, it's like, <clears throat> as you asked me when I first mentioned that I do the, that dish, you said, what are you gonna do about fresh shell beans? <laughs> well, it's, it's still winter obviously, and I won't have fresh shell beans, but you know, as you suggest in the book, the, the dried white beans, the cannellini beans can, you know, and I can coax a pretty nice creamy texture from those. Yeah. And then what am I gonna do about the monkfish? Well, it turns right. out, my fishmonger said, sorry, no monkfish. And my local grocer said, well, I could get it, but I won't because it doesn't meet our ethics policy. Oh, so what? What's then the I, you know, I go to sleep tossing and turning and I think, what if I did like, instead of poor man's lobster, real lobster, I could poach lobster tails, you know, or, and then I'm thinking, what about our wonderful halibut that's available, oh you know? God. But just, I, so I'm gonna do a butter poached fish and I'm gonna mm -hmm. do beans. And it's going to evoke the same feelings that the recipe in your book does. But as you know, when you're, you, I'm sure you've cooked from books too, where you simply have to make adjustments. So if, I have to make it adjustments. won't be monkfish. No, but but that's but but Greg, that's the whole point. I mean, it's what you can get locally, what you can get in the season, and you know, you are a chef, so you know that a white fish and white beans will evoke this gorgeous meal that you might have in Paris, France. Sure. So that's the fresh time from the garden. <laughs> yeah, it's completely coherent. Mm -hmm. You know, and um, monkfish is an Atlantic fish. It's you know, so people will do what you're going to do, and and I think, you know, I think any kind of recipe. I used to always say in my books, use it as a as a guideline. Don't yeah. feel like you're in a straitjacket. I do kind of like it now when people follow my recipes. After being a cooking teacher, I really do like it when people go step one, step two, step three. But in well, your steps are so sensible. Well, I try to, I try to make the recipes. I want people to succeed in the kitchen. I want no failures, but I'm devoted to local seasonal. So it, you have to, you have to go with what you can get. Right. I have a plot du jour every day. Uh, and in the before time, <laughs> when I had a dining room, we had a routine where each day of the week was that dish, you know, yes. in addition to our full menu, we had a plat du jour. So um, Monday would be the same thing every week, like lentils yes. and sausages. Oh, wow. Yeah, it was, uh, <laughs> yeah. we lay all racing on Wednesday for nine years, <laughs> eight years, you know, oh, wow. and then, uh, and, uh, you know, we had halibut, 
poached in olive oil on Friday nights for so many years. But it becomes a tradition for the neighborhood people. You know, it's like, oh no, we're going to wait till Thursday night because it's lamb night. You know, right. <laughs> or you know, so. And, and, but when the um, when the dining room closed, I felt the need to change up those specials more frequently. Yeah. And so uh, the only thing that stayed consistent is I do fried chicken on Friday nights. <laughs> but the the rest of the plot du jours. Uh, follow exactly the kind of uh, prompts that you describe. It depends on what's available, what's in season, what I need to use up. Um, you know, maybe I have something I got for the menu that just didn't sell that well, but I can repurpose it into a different direction. Or because I use whole ducks and everybody wants the duck breast, I have a lot of duck legs and thighs, you know? <laughs> so there's well, confit and then of course confit segues to cassoulet. So cassoulet is a regularly recurring special but you've got a you've got a recipe in this book for duck like thigh pieces that you braise and they're on oh, I missed that one. <laughs> oh my god well you'll make that for one of your wednesday nights or something of course you know the plat du jour in france is you know it's at the cafe it's at the bistro it's at the brasserie and so a lot of neighborhood people come every day or people who work in the neighborhood so the chef has a very high bar to change every day. So what he, and I'll use the word he because most professional chefs in France are men. Let's say he does a, a shoulder of lamb or a leg of lamb. The next day he'll do ashi parmentier with the leftover lamb. So ashi parmentier is shepherd's pie. So mm -hmm. it's very classy shepherd's pie. And if you look at the picture in the book, it's I'll, I'll try to find it, but you know, it's basically leftovers. Right. But you've got to, you know, you've got to make them yummy and add something fresh that lifts them. So you do that naturally because you're a, a chef. It's there, there's a nice uh, kind of frugality to it, isn't there? You know, of um, utilizing everything. And I mean, I think for those of us who really love food, the stuff itself is kind of sacred. You know, we don't want to waste it. And it's, uh, you know, you know, like uh, an animal gave its life for that shoulder of lamb. <laughs> you can't just simply take the best bits and discard the rest. That wouldn't make sense even if you could afford it. But you know, that, that's a principle uh, of the farm also. It's like the total honor of the ingredients. So if you, you don't throw food away, in France, you do not throw food away. So even, um, I just did a recipe, you know, I, I don't know if you've been to the online platform that I'm doing. I'm teaching no, online. It's called dancingtomatoes. Com. I did go there briefly just uh, because it was the best link to for me to find out more about your book. But so um, I just did a recipe for that where I roast a chicken with um, Dale bread. Ooh, nice. <laughs> I mean, most people would throw out the bread, but if you roast it with a chicken, all of a sudden it becomes like a, a fabulous, luxurious ingredient. So nothing is wasted. Very true. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, I guess um, that challenge of the beans kind of reminds me of, uh, or the beans and the monkfish, um, how hard it is sometimes to translate a recipe, you know, into your own neighborhood in your own kitchen uh, when it was developed somewhere else by someone else. But you have so many uh, helpful tips for smoothing the way. Uh, do you want to talk a little about about these uh, astuces, the little hints you offer along the way? Well, they're kind of um, a way for me to cheat a little bit because I'm thinking when I'm doing a recipe, I'm thinking about a student or a cook at home and they're going, wait a minute, this is what the directions say, but what about, what about if I can't find that size piece or, you know, something? So the astuce is a tip and it's my tip to say, okay, look, if you cut the carrot this way, you'll get that much more flavor from it. If you want to use the herb stems in a stock, don't throw them away, use them in the stock or whatever the tip might be. It's a way for me to be teaching and amplifying the, the method so that when someone does a recipe, they don't, they don't just make it, they understand what they're doing with it. And I think that's what gets me excited about cooking. So I just impose that on my readers. It's what I like about books too. You know, you can just insert a little something and uh, it's almost like having, uh, you know, if, if we were cooking together in the kitchen, 
you'd be kind of whispering these things as little asides, you know, and uh, it's fun. I, I really appreciate that. And your head notes too are especially informative, I think. You know, here's that braised lamb. Oh, that's the Ashi Parmentier. I love that dish. I love that photo. And I like the way you put it in a ring mold. So yeah. it's just, you know, it's just, it's, it's so elegant, but it's like you say, it's just simple farm cooking. Yeah. Stuff. And, you know, it's funny, I was thinking about an S juice, you know, I've, I've got a herring and potato salad with red onions, which is the most homely, homey dish. And you make it and you think, where has this been on my life? You know? <laughs> herring and is surprising I, that way. Well, it's so, it's so amazing. You take three little inexpensive, gorgeous ingredients, you make a salad and you're just like, wow, I should have invited the queen. And did you, know? you suggest serving it warm as an entree too? Yeah, I love it that way. I it sounds amazing. It. Like I think of it as kind of like a appetizer sort of, or like a part of a metze almost, but. To... No, we, it's a real dish. I mean, it's like a plat du jour for us and with a green salad alongside. Nice. And then, of course, you have a dessert, like like shoe pastry stuffed with whipped cream. And <laughs> or that beautiful lemon tart of yours that oh. I can't wait to make. That that thing is beautiful. And no meringue. And Great. no meringue. Who I did the anyway? paper. No <laughs> meringue on top of the lemon tart. <laughs> it does just sort of mask the the wonderful tart intensity, doesn't it? Well, I think meringue intimidates the hell out of everybody, you know, <laughs> it can drip and it can burn and, you know, I love to make it and I love to use the little kitchen tool and burn it and everything. I love that. But so, there's something to be said about simplicity mm -hmm. and just make the filling, make the pastry. You've got a gorgeous tart. Yeah, the tart al citron. Oh, yeah, I could eat that now. It looks almost like it's a miniature one in the book, but it is. Uh, but the the recipe is for a full size one. But you could do yeah. it either way, I imagine. Well, you can do it either way, and I give explanations for it. I have these little tiny, you know. I mean, I have a cooking school, so I have every piece of everything. So <laughs> I have these little tiny molds, and they're great. Oh, and I you know, no, it's like they're two part <laughs> with the. Yeah, it's a removable bottom. <clears throat> and the thing about I love to make individual desserts because. People feel so special. It's true. If you get a piece of something, it's one thing, but to get your own little something. <laughs> it's like, you don't have to share, you know? It's like, right. it kind of feeds that ego thing, you know? <laughs> and I think especially now I'm noticing um, with the food in boxes, oh, it's, right. uh, there's an element of the packaging of it that I really love. It, it makes it like a little gift, you know, yes. or at least it feels like a little bento thing, you know, somebody paid attention to how it went into the package. You know, I would hardly agree with you. And the only meal I've ordered out was uh, the 31st of December. And there's a little restaurant near here and it's a mom and pop. And I just thought, you know, support them, we're going to have a good time. And nice. they packaged the dishes in these boxes that were like origami. So you get it home and you kind of have to cook once you get home, you know, because mm. you have to eat this and you have to whisk that. And oh, I didn't know. It's like a kit more than a it's like a takeout. kit. And it was so beautifully packaged. It was like a gift. It was like a gift. Nice. Well, uh, are you still? In Normandy, or are you in Paris full time now? I moved to Paris full time a year ago. Yeah. And how is that? Do you are miss you... the country? Is it noisy in Paris? Or yeah, and no. <laughs> I mean, it's where I live is not noisy. I mean, because I live at the back of a building. I mean, it can be noisy if the neighbors are breaking the law and having parties like they're doing. But um, uh... we don't tell on them because we need joy. Everyone needs joy and they're not big parties. They might be four people. Everybody's just so excited to be like doing something. Um, do I miss the country? I miss my friends. It's always the same when you move, you miss your friends. Of course. And it's only an hour from here, but it could be 12 billion light years, you know? Right. So uh, my house is rented to the mayor of the town and I'm very happy about that because he's very happy about that. And so it's it's a parenthetical moment. 
Interesting. But I, love, I love living in the city. I absolutely adore it. That's the last time I saw you in France. You, we yeah. had a, a glass of wine on the Ile Saint Louis. At the I remember. There. I remember very clearly. It was fun. It's just such a pleasant place. I love the scale of Paris. I love the feel of it. I, the first time I went there, I was so intimidated. But by the time Betsy and I left, I felt like Paris was home. It's you the know, proportion of it. It's the scale yeah. of it. And you know, uh, it's funny because um, I've had occasion recently to write about Paris and uh, for a project. And Paris really is the city that you want it to be. So every individual who comes to Paris has their Paris. So, you know, in thinking about what's the most beautiful that. part of Paris, well, who are you? It's, <laughs> you know, I mean, my favorite bridge is the Pont Alexandre III. Why? Because it's Baroque and gold and showy and kind of, I suppose, obnoxious. I mean, it's somebody else is going to love the Pont Neuf because it's austere and ancient. And, you know, every time I look at the Louvre, I just imagine all the people who used to live there. And how could you live there? It must have been so cold, you know? It must but, have been. Oh, so cold. And, yeah. you know, you get in a taxi and you're driving around the Place de la Concorde and he goes, well, there's where the scaffolds were during the revolution. You're like, uh, I'm not sure I needed to know that. Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, crise de cour. Don't have a heart attack, sure. but. <laughs> right. uh, yeah, it's weird. Paris uh, is full of surprises and so much interest, uh, and so many interesting things. That, but when I got the book and, and saw the title and thought of you, I thought of Normandy and remembered uh, one of the very first meals I had in France. Betsy and I had a rental car and a three-year-old, and we drove from Paris to Normandy. We went to visit the cathedral at Chartres. Oh, so beautiful. Oh, so beautiful and so interesting. And what a wonderful introduction to France for me. Yeah. Um, we had a commitment in Provence. So our plan was to, to drive a big diagonal across the country and see as much of it as we could on the way. And that, that was the year I, I got to work for Roger Verger at the oh, Moulin wow. Rougeon. <clears throat> it was a, a different era, Susan. 1993. <laughs> yeah, no we women in that the... professional kitchen, I'll tell you. Okay. Well, you know, I trained in Paris in the early 80s. And let me tell you, I mean, there was no Me Too going on at that time. I hope they weren't too I mean, rough on you. There was a lot of me too going on, but <laughs> right. you know, it was just like, you want to be in the kitchen, you just kind of grit your teeth and keep going. It was true for anyone. Uh, I, <laughs> I remember my arrival. I was so naive that I didn't bring a chef's coat. And uh, the chef de cuisine, a Serge Chole, wonderful guy. But he said, uh, you can't come in, uh, I'm sorry, to the kitchen. I said, really? I've come from America. I have this appointment to work here. And he said, you don't have a chef's jacket. And I said, is there a spare? He said, no. And uh, then uh, I said, well, is there someplace I can buy one? And he said, if you really spoke French or if you understood the area, I could talk to you about that. But all I have to say for you now is you can't come in without a chef's jacket. It what was so cold and so strange. I was just yeah. mortified. But we drove to Nice. I asked a stranger on the street, um, you know, is there a uniform shop? Or I, I think I said some stupid phrase like, is there a place for clothes for working in? <laughs> you know, just some, I had some complicated way of getting out. Where do you, how do you ask for a uniform shop? Anyway, uh, I was directed, taken by the arm by this uh, graceful, you know, individual, uh, a lovely older woman who said, follow me this way, go that street, two blocks, then take a right, the shop's on your right. And uh, so I went there, I got my chef's jacket, I was back to the restaurant in less than an hour, not too shaken up. And from then on, I was welcomed, but I was of given course. the most tedious tasks for, you know, but I was happy to do them, you know? But, you know, I felt that way too. And I say, you know, the kitchens were very macho, but, and, and you know, this book, Plat du Jour, to me evokes an older time in some ways. I mean, there are very contemporary recipes, but it evokes what I learned when I was in the kitchen, which is the finest ingredient, whether it's a leaf of spinach or a head of lettuce or a shallot, 
and you just get this abundance. And yes, you do need to clean it, rinse it, take the stem off of it. But, but you've got this beautiful food and you just have to get out of its way. And it does so much. And I remember, I mean, I just loved every second of it. I loved it. In, in, in the restaurant still, kitchens. Yeah, I still the, do. That, that meal in Normandy, um, we asked an apple farmer, where should we eat to get the local flavor? We'd, we'd found an apple farm, a you pick apple farm, pick some apples. And then uh, the farmer sent us to a, a gas station and he said, they have uh, one meal a day, but it's always perfect. And his wife is saying, don't send them there, you know, send them someplace nice. And he goes, no, no, you want the local flavor. This, you have to go here. So it was in fact a gas station off to the side. It's a family run, mom's in the dining room, pops in the kitchen. And the one dish of the day is pot au feu. And we're served bowls of the broth that's like velvet, you know, and so fragrant and so much umami. And then comes a platter of meat and vegetables, three kinds of mustard. And then afterwards, cheese or ice cream, you know, and the cheese was some simple processed, you know, and a scoop yeah. of vanilla. But uh, that was all about that plot, you know, just that. But that's and, plat du jour. I mean, that's. And you've reinterpreted it. that. What was your pot au feu? You did a pot au feu of. Of fish. Yeah. yeah. It, so, I love that. It's because well, it's, it's so wonderful. traditional, so new. Right. But there's also Boeuf Bourguignon in this book. And one mm. of my favorite recipes is on the cover. It's um, it's the carbonade de boeuf with oh, where you Belgium. put a piece of spice bread and you cook it with this beef and you can do you can use speculose cookies. But the spice and the bread, you know, people, I mean, the French throw bread in their soup like they throw chocolate in their Boeuf Bourguignon or their, you know, it's I mean, they're just all these little secret things that you do, which I explain. But I love that. And that restaurant you went to is, was probably a routier. So it was exactly. there with truck drivers. And I'm telling you, you get the best food in those places, but you get plat du jour. And it's the food everybody wants to eat, especially now. I really feel that, you know, and there, like I said, um, there are contemporary recipes in here. I have a dish of avocados and cherries, you know, to start a meal. Now that sounds really weird, but it's completely coherent because those two seasons overlap. So I'm at the market, I'm looking at avocados and there are these gorgeous cherries and I'm thinking, wait a minute, sweet tart with avocados, beautiful color. Well, why not some chives? I mean, it, it's gorgeous. It's simple. Here's some scallops, put it on a bed of cherries and avocado. <laughs> right. Oh, this is a recipe I love. I hope you'll try it. I, I love the look of that with those yeah. jolly little red peppers. They're so cute and they're everywhere. And it turns out they're developed in Holland for colder climates. So they'll be perfect in the Pacific Northwest. They and have a nice snap. They're, and I steam them lightly and stuff them with this gorgeous tuna and caper and garlic mix. Oh my God, they're amazing. And you can, you can eat one for an appetizer two for a first course or six for a main course, you know, and it's just adaptable and simple. Delightful. I wanted to talk to you a little bit about that fig bread. Oh. That's a, it's a fig and hazelnut bread with cocoa nibs. Yes. And we're gonna offer it as kind of like in the place of what would be in a mousse on my tasting okay. menu from your book. Perfect. You know, it's just a little, a little, Something. <laughs> well, it's a savory, it's called, in French, it's called cake. K -E -K. Mm -hmm. Well, they spell it C-A-K-E and they call it cake. And the cake was sort of a phenomenon in the 70s, you know? So you'd go to someone's house for dinner and they make a cake or they bring it to a picnic or something. And it's been revived. So I just think it's the coolest thing. It's like an eggy bread savory bread that you can pretty much wrap anything in. So this fig with hazelnuts and cocoa nibs is, it, I, there's fennel seed in it and it's uptown in a way, but you just kind of mix it up and throw it together and bake it in a loaf pan and there you got it. And I love Are to cut it in like Cubes or slices or? You no, know, I cut a slice and then I cut it uh, on the diagonal. So you've got little um, triangles. 
kind of thingies. And then you, you, you put those prettily on a plate, like you could put them prettily in a little box and people mm -hmm. just, and they go with everything from champagne to apple cider, you know? You know, Verger did uh, a cake of, it, it was a uh, zucchini and carrot um, and a very dense sort of heavy, um, and then it was in paper thin slices that were toasted almost like Melba toast. Oh, wow. And uh, if if I'm not mistaken, he served it with a chef. Um, I believe it. I believe it. I mean, actually, you know what? If you've got leftover fig cake, I mean, you could you could do a little round and put some melted and put some chef and put it in the oven. I just love this whole idea, you know. And it's it's not like a sweet bread, but it's like a quick bread in a way. I mean, it's right. not it's not going to take a huge amount of effort to put this no. together. So no, no, I'm really looking forward to this one. Oh, you'll love it. You'll love it. And um, yeah, it's funny. And I, I think you should make the pain bagna also from from the Cote d'Azur, the sandwich. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The That's, tuna sandwich. Yeah, well, yeah, it's a tuna sandwich. I mean, but it, there are all these rules. You know, there's like a pain bagna club. And they've <laughs> established rules for what you can put in it and what you can't put in it. And I Isn't love that. Funny? Yeah, I think you include the list. Of I do. what can and cannot you know, be in there. You know, one of the things I love about France, you start researching dishes like pambagna. I mean, I've, I know what it is, but I want to be sure I know what it is. And you find out there's a confrérie, which means a brotherhood of <laughs> pambagna. And it's usually men, but sometimes women. They get together to discuss the merits of pambagna and how to protect it. And they have like an outfit that they wear. And the head of the club has a scepter and they've awarded these, you know, they, they like take the pulse of all the restaurants on the Côte d'Azur. And if you are doing it right, you get a plaque to put by your front door. So nobody's fooled when they go in. And it's it's same for Salad Nicoise. I mean, there are police out There's there. Like, for soup or pistou. Maybe is soup or pistou have one? Uh, no, uh, soup or pistou doesn't, but it could. I might start one. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Uh, silly, isn't it? It's the, wonderful, though. The it's costumes wonderful. are the part that uh, take it over the top for me. But you know, it's what it's how the French feel about their food traditions, their their culinary heritage, and it is not arch. It's totally, totally sincere. You know, it is. They know what they have. I think it's funny too that when the French discuss the authenticity of their dishes. They seem angry and intense, but they're really having a wonderful time. <laughs> well, you know, the French, I mean, you know, I've lived here a long time. They do seem angry and intense a lot, you know, <laughs> like around the dinner table. You know, they argue, they discuss, they they pause it, they do all this stuff. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I've, I know Americans are, we're kind of sensitive. We take things personally. So like I'd go weeping from the table and they go, well, you know, we're just talking about politics or you know, I've learned now that a good, healthy argument is going to happen no matter where you are. And, you know, I'd go shopping. I mean, I, I spend my life shopping at the market or the grocery store. And there are a lot of times there are men with these long lists of ingredients that their wives have made. So they're like looking at their list. And, you know, you'll get into discussion. They'll talk about their favorite pot of feu and you'll talk about yours. And they'll look to you and they'll go, well, no, that can't be right. I mean, I'm from the region of pot au feu. So mine is better than yours. <laughs> like, okay. <laughs> What's the best bean for cassoulet? <laughs> oh my God, the best bean for cassoulet is the bean you got at home. <laughs> you know? But, oh, you know. I, I had no a woman said. at the restaurant who was from Taubay. And, you know, the, yeah. the, the bean from there is supposedly the one. Yeah. And uh, I had it um, because... At Rancho Gordo, a farm in California that specializes in beans, and it is the it is an excellent bean. But I just thought that's the sort of thing that could uh, send somebody <laughs> into a headspin. In a... well, but these are important. To, that was important to her, and she's she's chauvinistic about her stuff. So this is the pambagna, just so everybody can see it. This is the sandwich, and it's on a huge bun, which you can't buy. So I give the recipe to make the bun. <laughs> and then I tell people, you know, you're on your own to how you're going to figure out how to eat it. 
Yeah, they are messy. Do you weight yours? Like, no, uh, I, I do not suggest weighting it, but you do put oil on the bread so it kind of soaks it up. So it kind of it has a little heft and then you, you know, it's like eating a po' boy or anything like that. You just got to get into it. <laughs> Wonderful. But that's a summer thing, you know, that's not even something I'm going to start thinking about until J June or July. That was a, uh, the, the guiding star for putting together a menu from your book is, you know, which of these recipes is going to be best right now. Right. And uh, I appreciate how you point those things out, you know, as we go along. And then there are things that you could serve just any time of year, like two puffs with whipped cream and chocolate sauce. <laughs> Don't you love those? Oh, you know, I do. And I'm surprised I do because I'm not like a shoe puff person. Really? But I had that dish at a restaurant. It is shoe pastry that you put sugar on top of and then you stuff it with sweetened whipped cream and you dip it in this amazing chocolate sauce that is so simple. Milk, cream, water, and chocolate. And that's your sauce. Anybody can what make it. What <laughs> Nothing. And you just dip it and it's kind of messy and wonderful. And you have to have like 12 napkins, but oh my God, it's a perfect plat du jour dessert. And the vanilla creme brulee, it's almost exactly like the one we serve at the restaurant. I was tempted to put that on the menu just to, oh, we'll already have that done. <laughs> well, but then I saw go. the lemon tart and I swooned. Oh, but you'll love that lemon tart. And you know, once you've made it, like I've made that and it's very simple. It's, it's, um, Patsuke, which is a cookie dough, mm -hmm. like thing with the lemon in it. And sometimes I'll put a little melted chocolate on the bottom first, let that harden, and then put the lemon in. That's really good. Really I'm sure good. It is. <laughs> <laughs> well, how could it not be? It's uh it's perfect lemon season too. That's one of so my uh, another recipe that I'm kind of surprised you didn't choose because I know you a little bit. It's King Henry the Fourth's potato soup with the poached egg in it. It's oh. potatoes and garlic. And King Henry the Fourth was from the Bayern and he loved garlic all his life. And so this was one of his favorite soups. And you take potatoes and starchy and you take garlic and you cook them till they're, the potatoes are soft. Then you crush them with a fork so it's soupy. And you poach an egg in that soup. And you serve Lovely. a bowl of soup with a poached egg in it. I, I swear it is the best thing. It costs eight cents to make. <laughs> it takes no skill or talent to make it, except that when you eat it, you think, wow, this is amazing. And when I was researching the recipe, I came across a little saying from King Henry, Henry IV's first mistress, who evidently told him, he, she said, you know, you smell like a dead bird. Because you eat garlic all the time. Oh, no. <laughs> How sad. <laughs> Poor guy. I loved it. I mean, she said that to a king. Henri Le Cap. I suppose uh, she would know, though, if, you know. <laughs> and she, her, she kept her head. So it wasn't, you know, uh, Louis XIV or his band of meanies, you know. Maybe he liked the uh, smell of dead birds. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I liked a, a dish I almost chose uh, was this uh, happy toast with oh, chicken livers, so lardo, caper sauce. That is just the light. I'll, I'll hold up the picture and you can talk about it a little. Well, this is a true plat du jour from a genius of a chef. This little tiny woman named Claude, and she has a restaurant called Miss Lunch. And the funniest thing is, you know, I go to the restaurant, I meet her, she's this artist person and she serves this dish. It's her most famous dish. People come from all over the city to eat it. It's toast with pancetta. Then you fry um, chicken liver that you've marinated in some ginger and soy sauce. And then you put a, a, a beautiful sauce verte herb vinaigrette on top. I'm serious. You can serve it as an appetizer, cut it in little fingers, or you, I serve it as a plat du jour. And it is so good. And again, super easy to make. And, you know, chicken livers. It's chicken livers. I and if you don't have pancetta, you can use bacon, <laughs> you know? Lovely. And the lardo, is that... Uh... 
easy to get? Lardo is easy for me to get. You know, it's it's just pork fat that's been cured in spices and salt and pepper. Um, it's easy for me to get. It's easy if you have an Italian grocery. And if you don't use pancetta, and if you don't use bacon, very thin sliced though, it has to be thin sliced because you put it on the hot toast and the fat melts into the toast. It, I've seen it melt that way and it looks almost like a slice of Havarti melting over something. Almost, yeah, you know, and it's it, wonderful. It just goes gossamer. Exactly the word. And yet, then you've got these kind of hunky chicken livers on top. So it's beautiful. Um, and, you know, I want to say a word about fat. Because plat du jour, the dishes in this book are, they, they embrace fat, but they don't wallow in it. So like that chicken liver with a little bit of lardo, everything is in proportion in France. So I joke sometimes that a dish with a cream sauce is considered light by the French <laughs> because it doesn't have a butter sauce. Right. <laughs> um, but even if you're adding cream to a dish, you're not overwhelming it. And the veal, the, the spring veal stew in here, the, the, um, oh, oh, it's wonderful. It's flavored with lemon. It's got these little spring veggies in it and you thicken it with cream and egg yolk. I mean, unbelievable, unbelievable. And yet, I believe you. <laughs> and I don't do a lot of veal because I'm politically opposed to industrially produced veal, but there's a ton of happily raised veal in the US and in France. There are labels that, that you probably know this that set it apart. I find it problematic. I, I don't have easy access to uh, uh, veal that's been raised in a way that makes me feel okay about it. But I think it's really important uh, uh, for people to understand what veal is. You know, it's a young cow that's fed mostly on its mother's milk and the very best veal, as you talk about in the book, also has some time on grass. So it's, it a, it's a young male cow. And uh, the reason it exists <laughs> is because the dairy cows have to be freshened. Uh, a dairy cow can't simply give milk indefinitely. She has to give birth, give paws, and then uh, and uh, the the calf has to be sacrificed because the dairy farmer uh, has to get the milk again. <laughs> right. So uh, and it's kind of a natural and wonderful, but in our industrialized farming practices, it gets pretty brutal because you know well, the, and, the young cows are isolated and it's just ugly. But uh, properly raised veal is a uh, is so wonderfully tied to the country. The way you were talking oh, about farm life, it's totally within the system. The sort when of when you eat it in context, it, it's so but, good. But you know, the other thing about veal in France is it is not gummy like it is in the U.S. I mean, you have to chew it. It's actual meat, mm -hmm. and I think I don't know where we got into this white uh, uh, a meat that you didn't want to chew. Somebody the told me they said Americans don't like to chew their food. I don't know if that's true. Certainly not today. And I, it's not like I'm suggesting one eats veal every day. But veal is, is a noble meat in and of itself. And it does fit in with the order of the, the farm. So mm -hmm. the best veal I ever, where I really was introduced to it was on a farm in the Dordogne. And that's when I saw that, you know, that's when I understood that a veal is a noble meat that is set aside for something special. Mm -hmm. And the French, the French love it. Well, it's interesting because uh, I think every food in your book <laughs> is a special food that could be, you know, celebrated in the same way in France. And one of my favorite expressions there is, uh, and forgive my French, but uh, if I remember correctly, it's uh, rien c'est plus important que le déjeuner. Exactly. And it means literally nothing's more important than lunch. <laughs> yes. And it's often used in a way uh, as a don't get uptight, you know. <laughs> well, but, but you know, another thing is the time accorded to meals here. Yeah. And, you know, I have a friend, um, a, a friend who uh, ages cheese, and he said his, he was eating once standing up, and his grandfather walked in and said, no you wouldn't fill your car if the motor were running, would you? Sit down. 
<laughs> people here do sit down. They take time. And these recipes, some of these recipes in Plat du Jour will take time. They're, you know, they'll cook for two hours. You don't have to do anything for two hours. Right. <laughs> you can spend your 25 minutes getting it all together, putting it in the pot, maybe stirring it once in a while. But a lot of the food in here is quick. It is. And it's so satisfying. Another dish I really like, uh, and I'm glad you put it in a book, uh, is the uh, tar flambe or the flamme Oh, yes. Yes. You know, it's just, uh, I make that all the time at the restaurant. And it's so simple and so good. And, and I found the last time I was in France, a couple of bad ones, like factory made, you know, in, uh, and I thought, no, no, don't lose this, France. This is, this no. is a dish that you but really you have to Alsace, You know, everything can be industrialized, right? Mm -hmm. So I was hiking in Alsace uh, before Christmas and I'm dying for a tarte flambe. And I, there, it was, it was hard to find a really good one, I will admit. But, but if you search and search and search, you can. People are still making them at home. And what I love about that dish is it's um, onions, cream, and bacon on a very, very thin dough. And right. it's called the flaming tart because or burnt tart because it was put in with the coals in the oven with the coals. And the coals would burn the edges of the tart. So it cooks in five minutes. And I love that story. I love the idea of the farmer who was probably also the bread baker taking dough, quickly rolling it out, throwing these things on it, baking it and roll it. And then you'd slice it and roll it up and eat it. And if you go to Alsace, which is where it's from, you still see people doing that and they drink beer with it. It's wonderful. The first time I had it, I was in Paris and I had gone out on some simple errand and I was on my way back and I passed the shop and you know how the streets curve around the river and you get turned around? And yeah, I, every day. I thought I had stumbled into some magical like Narnia corner <laughs> of Paris because the, those costumes, you know, that they wear. I, I don't know how common that still is, but this was in the 1980s and uh, they had traditional uh, Alsatian attire to yes. serve up their, um, you know, flamkuchen. And, and, and it was served on paper you know, so that you could just grab it. And, and I ate it on the right. way home. And I thought, oh my God, this is the best thing I've ever had in my life. We kept going back to that shop and, you know, it's just, uh, it's a fun memory. You know, it's funny, all those things. I'm not sure that that shop is still there, but- I don't so remember what it was called. You know? And uh, I remember the little, um, in Paris, the little Frites sales people, they'd be like these tiny little skinny stores <laughs> and they'd sell you a cornet of Frites. So my daughter and I were walking around the city last week and we were starving to death and it was like 20 below zero. And there's a restaurant serving cornet of frites. Nice. And I thought, oh my God, you know, it's a new rest, it's a new place. But I thought, you know, this is great. They don't lose their traditions. That's so wonderful. <laughs> yeah, it's so and great. The, I love the way the frites there are always golden, never brown, yeah. you know. Yeah, they're so. perfect. And it, you know, I have a recipe in the book for a different kind of a frite. They're made with new potatoes and you blanch these rounds of new potato. Then you paint a baking sheet with olive oil, drizzle a little on top and bake them. Oh my God, they come out so amazing. I'm sure they but, do. You know, French, for every French homemaker makes frites at home. I mean, they're just part of life. The, uh, well, that double frying, I think is probably intimidating to a lot of Americans. Because to release the starch, I don't know if everybody knows this, but uh, most cooks know that you have to cook them first at a lower temperature, then fry them a second time in the hot oil to get them crisp. Yeah. And uh, we cheated at Marche. <laughs> we uh, steamed them first, which might be easier for home cooks too, you know. Oh, that's it. And it works the same. Gorgeous. Yeah. So the, they get, I just uh, get them barely tender in steam. Then I cool them. And then we throw them in the very hot oil and they're crisp, crisp, crisp. That's perfect. And it's so quick to do frites. That's what always surprised me <clears throat> because I would feel guilty that I wasn't a French mom sometimes. And I would make frites at home and I was always amazed. It's really not very hard at all. Not too hard at all. And Susan, which, before we finish up, do, are, are we going to take some questions from other folks? Was that our? Oh. Yes, absolutely. Hi. Um, Hi. 
have one. I'm afraid support. I'm leaving everyone out. Oh no, you're good. Um, and again, for those tuning in, if you just use the little Q and A button, you can ask questions. And we have just a few more minutes to get one or two more in. But right now, we have one from Carol Pucci who says, hi, Susan, I interviewed you for the Seattle Times long ago when you generously welcomed me into your home in Normandy. At that time, I left cooking over the open hearth. Now that you're in a Paris apartment, how do you create or recreate that cooking experience? Oh, it's so funny. I have the, the blessing of having a fireplace in my apartment. So I, if I want to, I can grill something over the coals here. And if you don't have a fireplace, you just you just have to use a grill or you have to use your broiler. Have you done the tart flambe in your? Uh, oh, your in the coals? You know, I do it in a really, really hot oven, really yeah. 500 degree oven. And you just stick it in there and it curls at the edges and it's just what you want. All right. Well, right now, I think that's our only question. So Greg, I don't know if you have one more you want to wrap up with or where we are. I'll unmute well, myself. I, uh, <laughs> I just wish that we could have you at the restaurant. And uh, it's so fun with a couple of Susan's books in the past, she's come over to Bainbridge and uh, we, we close the restaurant for everything else and focus just on recipes from her book for a day and uh, make a wonderful lunch for everyone and everyone goes home with the book. But I hope everyone who's following us today can do something like that for themselves. Um, take time to prepare a nice meal from the book. Um, allow yourself some time, maybe while the food is simmering, to really dig into the book because it's, it's full of wonderful moments that uh, Susan has shared just in a beautiful way. Thank you, Greg. And I, I will echo that and say, I, I think People are dying to cook and be together and you can really create a beautiful moment with the recipes in Plat du Jour. Yeah. I, I know I did. And I love the research you're right. <laughs> <laughs> and one more thing, uh, you can also try the tasting menu uh, based on recipes from Susan's book. Uh, March 3rd through 6th, I think. Uh, oh, wow. Uh, we're gonna make that the chef's tasting menu at Marche for that. Uh, second week of March or oh I wish I could come Greg I wish I could come you know who I knows I'll who send knows? you pictures <laughs> send me pictures and and everyone out there bon appetit and uh when you can come to France we'll sure be happy to see you <laughs> yeah and you can get the uh book again at booklarder.com thank you so much Susan Herman Lewis and Greg Atkinson for your conversation today it was so much fun and I know um there's a lot of comments about people just like dying to get to Paris and uh and France and so you you took us there at least virtually for a little while so thank you for well, that I'm, I'm so glad thank you so much for hosting this it was wonderful it was thank you beautiful. Greg Thank, thank you, you Susan. And thank you, Book Larder. I can't wait to get yeah. back in the store. Oh, I know. I can't wait to get to Bainbridge again and eat at Marche. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, everyone, for tuning thank in. You. Post this uh, to YouTube in the next couple of days and send you a link. So Wonderful. Thank, you, so thank yeah. you. And I would like everyone to visit me at dancingtomatoes.com. Dancingtomatoes.com. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Thank you, thank you so much, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.